Praise God for awakening us. I love the first couple lines of that song. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. How uh, relevant is that uh, to us right now? There's a lot of walls between us. Six feet. Six feet of distance at least, right? Um, and it's interesting as we worship today and as we gather again online, as we gather virtually, as they say, um, we think about this. And we really think about the gospel is all about reconciliation, bringing things back together to Jesus. And we're in a time right now where the struggle is that we're being kept apart, but nothing can separate us from his love. Amen? I trust that you're saying amen at your homes. Uh, but we're going to continue to worship this morning, um, and we are glad that you're joining us. So uh, let's continue to do that. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Well, I was going to say welcome to Faith Church, but I guess more welcome to your couch or your living room. But I'm glad that you guys tuned in here today. Uh, we just want to open up in a uh, word of prayer here and just ask the Lord to just use this time to encourage our hearts, to use this message to uh, just deepen his truth in our, in our hearts. God, we love you. We thank you for your guidance, for your sovereignty, for your protection. And we do pray that you would use this service, use this message that we'll be hearing here in a few minutes to just encourage our hearts. Um, I pray that you would grant peace, just give us peace and just times of uncertainty, just a lot of uncertain times here ahead of us. And as we read in uh, your word that you alone are our peace. What an encouragement that that is, God, and we thank you for 
uh, what you're doing, how you're using um, ministries like this uh, streaming online. And I pray that, we, that uh, you would use that in hearts of families all throughout our church to be encouraged. And we love you. You know me pray. Amen. Well, amen. Church, we've had uh, just a glorious Easter here at uh, your homes, I'm sure. The opportunity to see the resurrection uh, come into play with our teaching, preaching from last week, this week, getting into new messages. Look forward to that, getting into the Word here shortly with you. But we did take Easter at Faith Church to some of the homes uh, for the kids. We did kind of surprise with some Easter eggs at uh, some different houses and things. Uh, this past week, I know my house had surprise Easter eggs at it one morning, and my kids enjoyed uh, seeing that. We have a few announcements for you just to look, uh, look ahead. Thank you so much, as I have these written down, for your generosity in action. Uh, in our church foyer, uh, we do have basically gifts that have been brought in and given to the food bank, uh, to Crossroads Pregnancy Center. And again, your weekly giving, uh, you have just blessed us as a church. And it's really awesome to see your generosity in action in our benevolent fund and to see how that has grown by fourfold uh, just by your outpouring and your giving. And I know for many of you, it's not an easy time. It is an uncertain time. How long? Where is this going? Even financially, some jobs, but yet you give. And you have been generous in that way. And so I know some of you have asked, uh, even just with the stimulus checks that have come out, how can I help? Where are areas that we can uh, give as well? So continuing to give, of course, uh, your tithes, your offerings, uh, but in our benevolent fund is one great way to do that uh, to others. One neat area that has come out is uh, Faith Christian Academy. Uh, has kind of given us their, their wor final uh, word here of their school year for the next school year starting up. And so they're clearing actually out our building uh, now and taking all their materials and desks and teachers are packing up uh, all this. So the church is changing. The, our building is changing as we speak. And, and Faith Christian Academy has an unbelievable new facility that they're looking to head to, God willing, opening their doors uh, in September. And, and jumping into that school year. But that makes changes taking place here. And so one area that we're going to be looking into is basically renovations at our building. Uh, here in our auditorium, uh, looking in our teen area is so needed for this coming summer, as well as our children's area that we're talking about and setting up. And so there's ways that you can give there to our building fund and uh, be able to be part of uh, the building there. So that's another area uh, that you are able to give to. So we're excited about that, whether starting in the next week or months, just starting some of those changes to take place around here, uh, especially since the building is, is empty, uh, even in our auditorium to do that as well. Well, one uh, thing, last thing just to bring to you is our new website. If you haven't had the opportunity to get on it, it's good information on there, especially our videos. If you have time at home uh, to get into a video series that is available to you, uh, as well as praying for our missionaries. We have our missions page that is listed there on our website. You can see all of our missionaries be able to pray for them by name and have their picture uh, there as well. So that's exciting for you to get on and see that. Don't look at our calendar. It has really nothing on it, but it should, coming up in the future, be able to have our calendar information listed on it as well. So again, uh, an area for you to get into is our new website. Well, for many, uh, this is not an easy time. I know I was watching a movie literally last night, and I, in the movie, they had a, a group gathering at a restaurant, and it was a nice little cafe. It looked really fun. They had a whole bunch of people around. When a new person from their group came in, they gave them big hugs and everything. I'm like, ah, oh, I miss that. And so miss interaction. We miss you. And through all of this, we kind of sometimes we'll say, God, where are you in this? And so our next song really kind of sets up just this, where is God? God is here with us. He is mighty to save. No matter what we're facing, no matter what is coming in our path, what fears we might have, what failures we feel in our life, God is mighty to save us through that. If you are one here today who is searching 
and, and you're saying, what is this Jesus? What is this, this church? I know I need something more in my life. There is a God who is ready to save and ready to save you. In the book of Zephaniah, we don't turn there much, but in the book of Zephaniah chapter 3, this verse says, The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. The Lord your God, and he says it again, is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you. Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness Kindness of the Savior The hope of nations Savior, He can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the My fears and failures fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender, I surrender. the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king savior he can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and can move 
move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Amen. Praise God. Once again, for leading us in worship. Thanks, John. Well, we find ourselves once again in an empty auditorium. Um, yet the church still gathers, and the church still meets, and the church is still alive and well. And as you look back at the um, past 2,000 years of church history, um, the enemy has been active in trying to um, do whatever it can, our enemy Satan, to do whatever he can to thwart the mission of the church, right? To, To put an end to what Jesus and his disciples uh, continued 2,000 years ago with the church, and, and it seems the more the church is attacked or the more that the church encounters difficulty, it seems that the more the church grows in those seasons and in those environments. And I think we're, we can have every reason to be optimistic that through this season of difficulty, that the church can still grow. And one of the ways that the church will grow is by those of you that are a part of the church, continuing to realize and understand that even though there's a stay-at-home order, there's a quarantine, that that doesn't stop the mission of the church. That doesn't stop our individual responsibilities to, to reach people, you know? So whether it's doing something as simple as right now sharing this video on uh, your Facebook or, or, or through YouTube, on your social media, taking a minute to just say, hey, you know what, I'm going to share this. I'm going to specifically share this with someone that I know needs it. Someone that maybe otherwise wouldn't tune in, but because of all that's happening, there's a lot of people looking for answers. And we happen to believe that the Word of God has the answers. Maybe not specifically for this coronavirus, but the answers for what our greatest needs are. The answers for what happens at the end of this life that the Bible and Jesus talks about those things. And so our individual responsibilities are still the same. Our commitment to the mission of reaching people where they are and helping them take their next step, that has not changed at all. In fact, God may use this to open up brand new doors of opportunities that you didn't have before this. And so take advantage of those opportunities. Share the videos of our services. We're preaching the gospel and we're giving hope and and help and encouragement through the words of God himself. Take opportunities to connect through um, your your FaceTime chats with people that maybe you just haven't connected with in a while. Share burdens with one another. Listen, I understand that this is such an unprecedented time for us. Like you'll have good days, right, where you're like, I can do this, and then you'll have bad days where you're like, I don't know if I can do this anymore, and I, I hit those days as well. And so in, in those seasons, what we need is we need the church body to pour into us. We need to pour into the church body. So our mission of making disciples, our mission of reaching people where they are and then helping them to take their next step, that has not stopped. It needs to continue. Well, as we've gone through our coronavirus series, which is basically what we've been calling it, we haven't gone through one particular um, book of the Bible or even one particular um, passage. I have been taking each week and spending time in prayer, in conversation with others, just saying, okay, where is God now leading me? And so this has been more of a Holy Spirit-led type of series. Because I really feel that what God wants to communicate to you is perhaps something different every week. And that's kind of the way it's been. 
And yet what I've found through this, and it's, it's to no credit of, of mine, this is to the full credit of the Holy Spirit, is that as I talk to people, one of the things that I hear is, man, that's, that's what I needed to hear that week. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what, 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 what I needed for that moment or that day or for that week. And so that's really just God using his Holy Spirit to kind of communicate to you through his word, through what I've been working through and praying through each week. And so um, we're coming to a passage of scripture this week that um, is a story in the Old Testament that I want to walk through and just kind of talk about how it maybe can give us some insight into what's happening with our lives right now. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to go to the book of Judges. And uh, we're actually going to be uh, going to chapter 14 and work through a couple chapters. I told the team this morning, the media team, we're going through a couple chapters, and they um, questioned how long the sermon was going to be, but it, it's, it's, it's not going to be any longer than normal. Um, these stories in the Old Testament, these historical narratives, um, cover one story, but they cover a lot of chapters of, of the Bible generally, and yet the main point of that story is what we want to get out today. And there, there's a few things that I hope will be a help and an encouragement to you and will be a challenge to you as we look at um, the familiar, if you've grown up in church or been in church, the familiar story of a man named Samson. And, and we've heard him, if you grew up in church in Sunday school, you heard about the mighty Samson and the strength of Samson. They've even made movies about Samson. And so I re-examined the story of Samson this week, and I want to talk about it and preach through it this morning because I think it has some really vital, important truths that will help us as a church, and, and maybe for you, if you don't go to church or you're not religious but you're tuning in, will, will really be a help to you this morning. Apart from the fact that it's an absolutely fascinating story that we believe really took place, we believe that this is historical narrative, meaning this actually happened in history the time of the judges was a difficult time for the nation of Israel. And I think there's some parallels between Israel's response to God and maybe our response to God living uh, in, in, in 21st century um, America. One of the things that I've realized about my own life is that there is a pre-kind of coronavirus mindset and I think what is going to emerge is a post-coronavirus mindset. One of the things that I realized in my own life is that pre-coronavirus is I had a sense of security, but it was a sense of false security that I realized. You see, I had a sense of security in, in the fact that um, everything in my life and everything within our country was relatively stable. Um, we had a really good economy up until about a month ago. And uh, there's just no denying that. If you looked at your investments, they were doing well. Jobs were, were a plenty. Um, people were um, not worried um, about um, the economy and what was going to take place and jobs. They just weren't up until about a month ago. And there was a lot of security in that. There was a lot of security in the economy and everything was looking pretty good, right? And I know there were individual circumstances that people had, but overall, people felt secure because we had a strong economy. People felt secure because there was, you know, for the most part, um, good health. Um, again, there's individual diseases and health issues that individuals were struggling through. Um, but there was no overarching concern that if I go shopping that I might get a virus that could possibly land me in the hospital or even at worst kill me. That, that wasn't even remotely in the back of our minds. And so what we had and what I had was a sense of security in something that was stripped away from me within moments, within days. All of a sudden, these things that, that we were all secure in, God just kind of stripped those away from us and stripped away the security. And what it, re what it revealed to me was that we were living with a false sense of security. We were lulled into this false sense of everything's safe and you know, even easy. And it is, isn't it amazing how quickly that changed? And so there's, there's a parallel with the nation of Israel because Israel during the time of the judges was waffling back and forth and back and forth between covenant faithfulness to God, obedience to God, faithfulness to him and his law, and then completely like being lulled into a sense of false security, being lulled into a sense of, okay, you know, this is good and this is God's blessing, right? Like when God is blessing and, and, and things seem easy, 
um, we kind of get lulled into this sense of false security. And oftentimes what happens as a result of that, this is exactly what happened to Israel during the time of the judges, is they kind of drifted away from their faithfulness to God. And I know that's the case for many of you. Like what this has done for you is this has kind of awakened you out of that slumber that we've been in, thinking, oh, everything's good, and we kind of drift away from God a little bit. And some of you over the past months or years, maybe you kind of drifted away from God a little bit. You felt safe and secure and everything was going okay. And in that sense of false security, we kind of drift away. That's exactly what Israel did over and over. If you read the book of Judges, they drift into this sense of false security. And as a result, then they drift away from God and away from faithfulness to God and away from worship to God. And then they delve into the things of the culture and the world and false idols and all of those things that, that drew their attention. Why? Because they had drifted into a sense of false security and as a result, they drifted away from God. Well, the cycle of the book of Judges is one of faithfulness to God, drifting away from God, and then God, what? Stripping away their, their security. And so when Israel would drift away from God and be unfaithful to God, God would then allow the um, covenant curses to fall upon them. And one of those curses was that, was that they would have um, oppression by their enemies. They would not have peace in the land. One of the blessings of the covenant that God had made with Israel at Sinai when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses was that if you are faithful to the covenant, the result of that will be the covenant blessing, peace in the land. If you are not faithful, then you will not have peace in the land. That was one of the covenant curses. And so Israel waffled in and out of covenant blessing and covenant curse. And so just when they would feel like everything's good and they drift away from Yahweh and they drift away from faithfulness to him, what inevitably would happen was God would deliver them over to their enemies and they would be oppressed by their enemies again. And their security, their safety, all that they thought they were um, really secure in was stripped away and now they find themselves, uh, oh my goodness, what are we doing? What's happening? And that would wake them up. And then they would come to God in repentance and say, oh God, we've drifted from you. God, forgive us. God, we, we, we know we, we weren't finding our hope in you and we drifted away from our faithfulness to you. And, and then God would bring them back and God would restore them through the works of the judges. So Israel didn't have a king, but the book of Judges is described as a time in which every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so these judges judged Israel, but then they're Covenant unfaithfulness would produce covenant curses that would fall upon them, and as a result, then they would find themselves under the oppression of their enemies. Well, as they found themselves under the oppression of their enemies, they would then repent, be waken up. Oh my goodness, I've drifted from God, like many of us have kind of felt over the past few months, and oh, we've got to get back to God. We've got to get back to faithfulness to God, and so they would, and God would deliver them, and God would raise up a judge, and one of these judges would deliver them, and then they would have peace and prosperity, and then get lulled back into a false sense of security, and they would repeat that cycle over and over again, and they're in such a cycle in the book of Judges chapter 14, a cycle of unfaithfulness, being lulled to sleep, Right? Being lulled into a sense of security, drifting away from God, and then God dispenses the covenant curses and the Philistines, the ancient foes of Israel in the Old Testament, have oppressed them. They plunder their villages, they take their crops, they enslave the Israelites. So these were dark days for Israel, and Israel was looking for a, a deliverer. And that's where we find Samson. Samson was born to a man named Zorah. And uh, he was of the tribe of Dan. And his wife Manoah had a visit from the angel of the Lord, which we interpret as Jesus himself. And, and um, the angel of the Lord um, came to uh, Manoah and said, you're, you're going to have a son. So if you go back to chapter 13, 
It says there was a certain man named Zorah of the tribe of Dan, the Danites, the tribe of Dan, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. So, so an angel comes to a woman and says, You will bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the room and he shall begin to serve Israel or save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And so what we have here is we have an angel coming to a woman saying, you will have a son. And what this son will do is this son will be um, set apart and he, they, they, they made him take what was called a Nazarite vow. And no razor was to touch his hair. He wasn't to um, touch an unclean um, animal. Um, and he, there were certain things within this Nazarite vow, not to drink anything, um, wine or strong drink. So within this Nazarite vow, being set apart, sanctified unto God's purposes, he was to be used by God. And, and, and we see that in chapter 13, one of the things that God had planned for this child was that he would be a deliverer, that he would save Israel. Well, Samson grows up and the story of Samson really takes off in chapter 14. Samson went down to Timnah and, Tim, and at Timnah, he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines and he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among um, all our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me for she is right in my eyes. And so Samson sees this woman of the Philistines and he says, I, I got to have her. Mom, dad, I have to have her. And they plead with him and say, she, she's of the Philistines. And this wasn't so much a, a racial issue as it was a religious issue. Understand that they called them uncircumcised Philistines, meaning that these were not part of the covenant people of God. They, they were unbelievers. Uh, they were what they called pagans in the land. And, and the Philistines were, were brutal people, worshipped idols, even to the point of sacrificing their own children to idols, um, lived really, really sinful lifestyles. And, 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 and his father and mother were like, You're gonna, you, want, you want this, this woman from the uncircumcised Philistines? Not part of the covenant people of God? And he says, no, I want her. So the story goes on that um, his father and mother, verse four, interesting, did not know it was from the Lord. For he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So what's fascinating about this text is God can even use the foolish choices of men and women to accomplish his will. And that's what he's doing with Samson. What we're going to find throughout the story of Samson is that Samson does not make good choices. Yet through it all, God decides to use him in profound ways. And so the story says that they went down in chapter 14, verse 5. Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Now notice this. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. So there's this weird story of, of Samson being attacked by this lion. And then, here's the key, the Spirit of God is upon him, gives him the supernatural strength, and Samson destroys this lion with his bare hands. So the first thing we can see with Samson through this story is that God is upon him. The Spirit of God is empowering him in a supernatural way with this strength. That the source of Samson's strength was ultimately the Spirit of God. Samson was not strong apart from God being upon him and the Spirit of God being upon him. It says, after some days he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. So what did he do? He scraped it out of his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave them some to eat, and they ate. 
But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion because it would have been a violation of his vow to touch the carcass of that lion. So Samson is kind of making some really bad decisions, doesn't take his vows seriously, um, and so he's got some issues in his life. And, and I hope that if God can use someone like Samson, then it means that God can use someone like you too, someone like me, because we're probably not all that different from Samson in many ways. So the story goes on, and this is a fascinating story, that his father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what is within, what it is within seven days of the feast and find it out, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. So he says, hey, I, I've got an idea to make um, um, some get some, some valuables here, these, these linen clothes. I mean, this, this would have been incredibly valuable uh, for these people in this, in this time period. Um, 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. You're talking thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of, of um, clothing here. But they couldn't, they couldn't figure it out. And so on the fourth day, Samson's wife said, enticed, or they came to Samson's wife and said, entice your husband, tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Like I said, these, these people were brutal. Tell us the riddle, or we're going to burn you alive, and we're going to burn your father, and we're going to burn his house, we're going to take everything from you. So they threatened um, this woman that Samson was going to be married to, and they threatened her with death, a horrible, brutal death. And so her motivation was of one of, of saving her own life and the life of her family, and Samson's wife wept over him and said, you hate me. You do not love me. You have put the riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, behold, I have, told, I, have told, I have not told my father nor my mother. And shall I tell you? And she wept before him seven days that her feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard. So they're, they're having this wedding feast and she's pressing him, pressing him. And finally, he tells her. Right? She wore him down. Right? She, she, she wears him down to the point where he's like, okay, fine, I'll tell you what the riddle is. And so she goes and she tells the men. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? <laughs> and then he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would, have, you would not have found my riddle. And so, so Samson is obviously, he's upset, right? And uh, he's upset with um, his wife. He's upset um, with the fact that she's betrayed him. But now Samson's in a predicament because now he's got to find 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. He's got to come up with a way to, to make good on his bet with these guys. And so what he does is this. It says, and, and again, notice this, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. So even in the midst of Samson's kind of foolish endeavors here, the Spirit of God still is upon him. And what does he do? He goes down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. So, so here's Samson's issues. There was always consequences for our situations. So while the Spirit of God was upon him, Samson goes down with, with the strength of God, and, and he, he kills 30 men of the Philistines. Now, if, if you're understanding, well, this, this doesn't seem ethical, okay? Understand that God's enemies were the Philistines, right? God has enemies who were, who were wicked, who, who deserved uh, the judgment that, that was due them. And some of these Old Testament texts, some people have troubles with because it's like, well, how could Israel kill these people? This was not necessarily Israel's enemy. These were God's enemies. And the reason they were God's enemies was because of their absolute, utter wickedness. I mean, if you would have seen how brutally um, these people treated others, how they tortured and, 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 and burned alive people, 
just, just the utter wickedness of these people, you would have looked at them and said, oh my goodness, how can these people be allowed to live? And so God looks at the wickedness of these people and says, yes, I am a just God. Because I'm a just God, I will pour out my justice upon those who have lived these utterly wicked lives. And these were these Philistines. And so God was using Samson to mete out his judgment upon these pagan uh, Philistines. And so God in his justice used Samson to carry out that justice. And so he strikes down and kills 30 men of the town, takes their garments. So lest you think these men were innocent, they were not. But Samson's wife was given to his best man because Samson gets mad and leaves and goes back home. And so this woman's father, Samson's wife, gives, gives his daughter away to another man. Well, Samson comes back and he finds out. He finds out what's going on. And as a result, he gets really, really angry. As you would, like your wife has been given to another man. So Samson's upset, he's angry, he's losing his temper. So what's he do? Chapter 15, verse 4. He caught 300 foxes and took, tor- and, uh, took torches. I don't know where he found 300 foxes, but he, he got them. And uh, turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of their tails. So he tied their tails together, lit a torch and put it in between their tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain as well as the olive orchards. So Samson burned their crops, burned their grain, burned their orchards, decimating their crops. And the Philistines said, who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And so what did the Philistines do to Samson's former father-in-law? They came and burned his, the woman who was his wife, burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you. And after that, I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow. And he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock at Edom. So Samson is a thorn in the side of the Philistines. Understand the Philistines had the power in the land. They, they oppressed Israel. Israel did not have their freedom. And God is using Samson to deal with the Philistines. And so these men burn alive this woman who was his wife. They burn her father because of what Samson has done. So then Samson takes his vengeance out upon these men who had, who had burned alive his, his wife and her father. And then he leaves and says, okay, I'm done, no more. Then the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah. So, so Judah, right? The, the Philistines are coming to Judah saying, why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come up to bind Samson and to do, him, do to him just as he did to us. And so now the Philistines are like, no, no, we want Samson. So the army comes and they say, we want Samson. And so 3,000 men of Judah went to where Samson was, and they said to him, you got to come with us, because if you don't come with us, the Philistines are going to oppress us even more. There's an army on our doorstep right now because of what you have done, Samson. So Samson, you've got to come with us. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. And they said to him, no, we will only bind you and give you into the hands of the Philistines. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. And so Samson's bound with ropes. 3,000 men come and he's bound with ropes, right? And so as he's, as he's um, walking, they're bringing him to the army of the Philistines. And, he's, and so he he's, looks like he's a goner, right? It looks like he's done. The, the Philistines themselves have not um, uh, done anything with their military to um, attack any villages or towns within Judah. They just simply said, we want Samson. And so they said, here he is. And when he came to uh, Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. And the Philistines are upset. Here's the third time the spirit of the Lord rushes. This is a statement. The spirit of the Lord now rushed upon him and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire and his bonds melted off his hands. So these ropes just fall off his hands. 
And so, and so Samson's standing there. He sees an army of Philistine soldiers coming after him. And he does not know what to do. He's looking around, looking around. He's looking for something. And what does he find? He finds the carcass of a donkey. And what does he do? He found the fresh jawbone of a donkey and put out his hand and took it. And with it, he struck 1,000 men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have struck down a thousand men. So God used Samson. I mean, mean, you can look at this and say, are you like a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey? Listen, God can, with great power, put anything in your hand and use you to do incredible things. So God again was meeting out judgment on the Philistines through the hand of Samson. And then the story goes on. Chapter 16, Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and went into her. Like I said, Samson didn't make great choices. Samson, we don't look up as Samson as, as this person that's like, okay, be like that. This is a story about God. However, there are some lessons that we're going to learn from Samson here. And the Gazites were told Samson has come here. Okay, so remember, Samson had a lot of enemies, right? And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night saying, let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose. So he sneaks out at midnight. What does he do? He goes to the gates of the city, knowing that there's an ambush set for him most likely. And what does he do? Well, he took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron, something that is impossible for a single man to do. To lift the gates of the city and in defiance to these um, enemies of his, he drags these gates to the, um, outside the city and sets them on the top of the hill. So Samson continues to plague the Philistines. He continues to be a thorn in their side. He continues to just defy them time and time again so that they want him dead. Then we get to chapter 16, verse 4. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. So here we get the the epic story of Samson and Delilah, right? And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to humble him and we will each give you 1,100, 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that, no, that one could subdue you. And all of a sudden, Samson, we see, is lulled into this sense of, I am strong, I have had victories, nothing can touch me. And for the first time, we see this coming out of Samson's life, this sense of being lulled into a sense of false security, that Samson says, I have this strength, right? And no one can touch me. After all, I've, I've carried the gates of the city uh, to the top of a hillside outside of the city. I've killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. I've killed 30 men and taken their, their garments. I've killed a lion with my bare hands. Look how strong I am. So Samson is lulled in the sense of security that he actually begins to believe perhaps that his strength lies in him and not in God. So Samson plays this game with Delilah and said, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, I will become weak and be like any other man. So she does this. And she had men lying in ambush in the inner chamber and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. 
But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches fire, so the secret of the strength was not long, known. So Samson plays this game. Nope, that didn't work. The bowstrings didn't work. And so she comes to him and says, You have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. So her motive was the money. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So at this point, you've got to, if you're in Samson's shoes, you've got to be willing to say, okay, um, she is betraying me, right? Like, like she is trying to deliver me over. Like she's going to tie me up with these bowstrings and then lay an ambush for me. And so she comes to him again and says, Samson, you lied to me. So Samson's like, okay, all right, here, here, here's the truth. Um, new ropes, that'll do it. Tie me up with new ropes. I'll be like any other man. So she does this again. She took new ropes and bound him. And said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in the ambush were in an inner chamber, and he snapped the ropes off his arms like he had, like they were thread. Same thing. So Delilah says to Samson, until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And so he says, if you weave seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, I shall become weak. So while he slept, Delilah weaves seven locks of his hair, um, and wove them uh, into a web and made them tight with a pen. And the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Here it is again, the thirst. They're upon you. But he awoke from his sleep, pulled away the pen and uh, the loom and the web and defeated, you know, the guys who were ambushing him. So if, if you're me, you're sitting here thinking, Samson, what are you doing with this girl? Like, she's clearly trying to kill you. Samson was so confident in his strength that he didn't worry about it. He, he thought he was good. He thought nobody could touch him. And Samson was lulled into this sense of false security. And she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him, with hard, pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. That's pretty <laughs> severe. I mean, she, she didn't let up. And he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now notice this text here, because this is like, why would he, like, you know what she's going to do, Samson. You know she's going to shave your head. Why would you tell her this? Like, and, 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 and then risk being captured. And this is what happens. Delilah came to the Philistines and says, come up again, for he has told me all his heart. And she made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. Like, like she, she's not a good woman. Like, she's trying to kill you. Verse 20, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. Now, notice Samson's response. And this, this lets you know that Samson has been lulled into a sense of false security. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as like other times and shake myself free. But notice this, he did not know that what? Not that his head was shaven. Obviously, he realized that. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes. I'm telling you, these were brutal people. And brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. So Samson thinking, oh, I got this. Just like before, I will overtake these men. But what he didn't realize is that God had departed from him. That his strength from day one came from God and that God could take it away at any moment. And when God took it away, Samson didn't think that um, after his head was shaven that it would matter. You broke this vow unto God and now God had departed from you, and the strength of God had departed from you. But Samson was lulled into the sense of, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm strong, I got this, I got this, I can handle this. And God stripped that away. And Samson's life was now 
one of a prisoner. They burned his eyes out. They made him grind at the mill. And over time, it says his hair began to grow. It says the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and rejoice. And they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And now they said, this is Dagon, our God. He has given us the victory. They said, our God has given our enemy into our hand. The ravager of our country has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry and they were drunk with wine, they said, call Samson that he may entertain us. So, that, so they called Samson out of the prison. They began to mock him. By that term, entertain, they began to mock him. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there on the roof. There were about 3,000 men and women who looked, while, uh, looked on while Samson entertained and so Samson's brought out to be made a fool and a mockery, these 3,000 rulers of the Philistines. And Samson is brought low, and in verse 28, Samson called to the Lord. Finally, Samson calls to God. God had to strip away everything from Samson for Samson to finally call on the Lord his God. And sometimes maybe God has to strip away from us what we thought brought us security. God has to strip away from us our sense of security and our strength so that maybe we'll finally go to our knees and call upon God. Maybe that's what it takes for some of us. Maybe that's what it takes for you who have drifted from God, who, who have been running from God, for God to strip that away from you and in His love and in His mercy, strip that away, causing you to call out to Him maybe for the first time. And so finally, Samson calls out to the Lord and says, please remember me. And please strengthen me only this once O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. So Samson says, God, I realize my strength is from you. I realize that my hope is in you. I realize that everything I had was solely from you. And now that it was stripped away, Samson was brought to a point where he was finally admitting that, finally coming to God, finally saying, God, I need you, God. I need you. Samson grasped the two middle pillars of the house on which the house was rested and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistine. And he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtalol in the time of Manoah, his father. He judged Israel 20 years. And so in his dying day, on his dying day, Samson delivers Israel from her enemies. You see, the beginning of Samson's story with a promise to a woman from an angel to do what? Your son will deliver, your son will save your, the people of Israel. And how does Samson save Israel? Through offering himself, by dying himself, and in his death, he brings deliverance to the people of Israel. And so there's really just a couple of things that this story teaches us. So, so great story, Doug, right? Awesome, cool, right? Is that, man, this is amazing. What does it mean for us thousands of years later to read this? Well, first of all, Samson was set apart for God's specific purposes. And we saw that all the way at the prophecy to his mother that he would be born. 
And if you are a follower of Christ, we are also a people that are set apart for God's purposes. If you want to know what your meaning and your purpose in life is, it is to exalt Jesus, to obey him, to follow him, to worship him, to make much of him, to, to, to be a part of his kingdom that he has established with the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, with his death, burial, and resurrection. Like we are called a, a kingdom of priests, the Bible says. We are sanctified, meaning we are set apart. So in the same way that Samson was set apart for the mission of God, so you are set apart to do exactly what God has called you to do. And that's what I started this sermon out with, that our mission has not changed. Nothing has changed with God's expectations for us, that we are called to do what? To reach people where they are and help them take their next step. So we are set apart for God. We are set apart to live for God. We are set apart to worship God in the way that Samson was set apart. But just like Samson, number two, we are drawn to the temporary pleasures of sin for a season, aren't we? We are just like Samson. We can look at him and say, my word, what a foolish decisions you made. But we can mark in our own lives, if, oh, if we could tell the stories of our own foolish decisions and the consequences of our own sinful choices, that even though we are saved, even though we are trying our best to love God and serve him, what happens is we get drawn away from God and faithfulness to him. We get drawn into a false sense of security. We get drawn into a sense of, oh man, I'm doing well. My sense of security maybe comes from my job or my own strength, or my own ability. I exercise, and I, and I, and I, and, and I eat well, and, and you know, so disease and sickness maybe won't affect me like it affects other people, wherever your sense of security comes from. We get lulled into this false sense of security, and then we get drawn away from God, and then we get drawn toward what the Bible calls are the temporary pleasures of sin. This is our tendency. We're like Samson in so many ways. We get drawn away. That maybe God has to strip away some valuable things in our lives. Maybe God has to strip away our sense of security to draw us back to him, to draw us back to a deep dependence on him, to draw us back to a realization that, God, my strength and my hope and my security comes from you and you alone. So I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to hope in you. I'm going to trust in you because you're a big God who can do big things. And I'm done. God, I am done doing this on my own. And some of you just need to get to that point where you just come before God and say, God, I'm, as Samson did, I'm done living in my own strength, done doing this on my own. Because we are easily, thirdly, lulled into a sense of false security. We get lulled into this sense of this world is our home. My job is my bank account, my 401k. That, that brings me security. That's not where the security of the believer comes from. And as we've seen, that can come and go pretty easily. That's pretty fragile. So when God takes that away, are we shaken? Or do we stand firm on a foundation that cannot be shaken? So I don't, I don't want to go back to the mindset of thinking that my security comes from the temporary things of this world. I don't want to go back to that. I want to I continue post-coronavirus pandemic, I want to continue to have a deep, deep rest and trust and security in God and God alone. So first of all, Samson was set apart and so are we. But just like Samson is drawn away to the temporary pleasures of sin, so are we. Just like Samson is easily lulled into a false sense of security, so are we. But at the end of the day, what Samson gives us a picture of is a deliverer in whom we find strength and security. Samson gives us a picture of one who can save. And so just like Samson's mother was visited by an angel to prophesy his birth and to prophesy that he would be a deliverer, so, hundreds of years later, an angel made a visit to a virgin named Mary saying, you will also have a son and he will save his people, not from an external enemy with swords and spears, but he will save his people from what? From their sin. 
That just as Samson was raised up to be a deliverer, but he was a deliverer that failed in so many ways, that a greater deliverer, one greater than Samson, would be born. That where Samson failed, Jesus, the Messiah, would succeed. And he would provide complete deliverance for the people who are the people of God. Those who will place their faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. That God will deliver you from the condemnation of your sin. That God will deliver you from the penalty of your sin. That this is what Jesus does. As Samson delivered the nation of Israel from the oppression of their enemies, the Philistines, so Jesus became our deliverer who delivers us from our ultimate enemy, and that is sin and death. And so Christ, Jesus, is our deliverer that we look to. He's the one that we place our faith and our hope in for our deliverance. So going through the difficulties of a a, um, global pandemic, economic struggles, financial hardships, loss of jobs, loss of health, loss of life, that we can still have strength and security in the risen Christ. And that if you don't know him, that all you have to do is come by faith, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that he will take your sin, remove it from you, give you his perfect righteousness, gloriously save you, make you his chosen adopted child. And grant you eternity with him. Father, as we have looked at what for many of us is a fascinating story. God, I pray that it would not be lost on us. That we in so many ways can follow the same mistakes as your servant Samson. That he in many ways does reflect us, God. But yet, through it all, Lord, you, you were patient, and you used him, and you changed him, Lord. And he went through dark, difficult days that brought him to his knees. And Lord, perhaps these difficult days that we're experiencing, God, if anything, it will bring us to our knees to find once again a deep, deep dependence upon you. Not a dependence upon ourselves, Lord, or our strength, but a deep dependence in, in Jesus Christ. But God, this picture that Samson gives us of your son Jesus is the most glorious picture that we can see. Lord, a a picture of deliverance from sin, a picture of deliverance from the ultimate enemy that is death. So Lord, we just want to praise Jesus right now. We just want to to place our, our dependence upon Christ and Christ alone for all that we have. And God, we want to cry out today, Lord, that we need you. God, we're not looking to our government. We're not looking to our own strength. We're not looking to our own jobs or anything anymore, God. We're looking to Jesus for deliverance, God. We're looking to Christ. And so it's, it's with one voice that our church cries out to you, Lord. We need you, God. We need Jesus. Lord, our, our defense, our righteousness, God, that's what we need. And we cry out to you today, Lord. We need you and you alone.
springs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay So let's go through this week with that as our cry, right? Like, God, I need you. Whatever happens this week, whatever goes on, whatever changes take place, God, I need, I need you. So thank you so much, church, for worshiping with us this morning. If we can be of any help to you at all in helping you take your next step, please uh, look us up online, faithpa.com. Uh, you can find all of our uh, information there to call in. Send us an email directly. Our email addresses are right on the website. We will get back to you, and uh, we will try to minister to you the best way that we can through these times. Thank you so much, church, for your faithfulness uh, and your continued giving to this ministry to continue to support the needs of the ministry. We thank you so much for that. God bless you. Have a great week.